So, in that case, let's go ahead, we'll kick things off here for this interview. Let's start off having you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you were doing beforehand prior to starting up a business. Uh, I'm raised in China, and I came to Texas in the early 1990s for higher education. And then I settled in Dallas since then, so I've been in Dallas for 26 years. And I have been a very dedicated employee and a very passionate employer. That's, and hopefully lovely mother. <laughs> if kids agree, that's me. Absolutely. And was this the first business you started? Did you create anything beforehand? Or is this the, the kind of sole claim to fame for you? It is the first serious business I created. Mm -hmm. Before that was some uh, side businesses, not much, like selling some nutrition ingre ingredients mm -hmm. to private labs. Definitely. And moving towards the business, what inspired you, caught your attention, kind of drove you towards that field, starting up a business? Where did the idea come from? Good question. I was inspired by my college friends back in China. So at the time, it was uh, 2004, 2005. I do see the opportunity of uh, cost saving by importing made in China oil field equipment to the US market. Back then, in the US market, there was only one uh, large company doing this side of the business, and the name is called Weatherford. It went filed bankruptcy earlier this year. But back then, it was a great success story in China, in the oil field area. And especially, they were, their plants or their joint venture partners they chose were in Chengdu, China. And that's where my hometown was. So I got to know the opportunity and was inspired by them. Absolutely. So starting up, what did the first couple of years of the business look like? Where did you initially gain capital from? How did you really get it off and running from the get-go? Were there struggles you saw? What did you have to overcome to really get it off the ground? Um, yeah, the first couple of years are not easy. I got a partner also inspired me and put in the initial funding. It was quarter million, not much, and over over two years to put in uh, this money. You start in 2013, that's 2000. No, 2005, 2006. Ah, 2000, I'm sorry, okay, 2006. Yeah, 2006, that was it. And it was much harder than I thought to get the first customer. And more than being harder, it was a game changing, especially in the oil and gas field, to get those companies to accept made in China product. It's my first client actually were, was not in U.S. I got my first client in Mexico, Pimax, in 2007. How did you get the first? How did you get, how did you get them to agree to buy from you? A uh, very good question, Charlie. I, at the very beginning, I thought I did a really good sales pitch. I went there and uh, visited their plant, their oil fields, I saw a lot of brand names. They only use brand names, US brand names. So I pointed out some of those drilling equipment of saying those are actually made in China. It's a NOV, National Oil Well Products, but made in China branded US names. So it took me about half a year to, to get their trust. So they decided to do a trial on some mud pumps made in China. So I feel very successful in sales. But later on, when I know more about it, actually it becomes an oil boom and just they just can't find any of Western branding products or made product in US or worldwide. So they, well, I got in the business really because I have some inventories, product ready to sell. That's the truth. 
of course, I did some good job over the sales as well. So when's the first, when's the time you got your first customer? Which 2007. 2007. 2007. So the first two years you didn't have any customer. Correct. A year and a half, there's no no customer at all. Okay, what uh, were you doing during that year and a half? Uh, I traveled extensively, meeting the customers in U.S. and worldwide, and back to China. And I tried all at the time. I tried rig zones. I tried all media and uh, traditional sales pitch. So worked hard on that. So you make cold calls. Give up. You make cold calls and went to trade shows, things like that. New Yes, yes, numerous trade cold calls and all trade shows that I can find. Okay, definitely. And yeah. you mentioned that that first client was down in Mexico. Uh, what was the time period between that first client and actually getting those stateside clients as well? Uh, it's about three months, mm -hmm. three four months after that, because Paymax has a lot of uh, contracts and suppliers and customers in Texas, especially in Houston and over the border and everything. So my name, my company's name was spread out after after the first product arrived in Paymax. So then they came to me and a lot of them are saying, oh yeah, you called us or we found your email in our mailbox, blah, blah. So I reached out to them beforehand also. So it became easier after you get your first customer and uh, your name got some recognition. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And on the state side, sales side of things, did you feel that there was any one particular type of customer that wanted your business or was it just kind of across the board from there that people started using your guys' products? Uh, our product is the, uh, well, I started with some oil drilling products and parts like mud pumps and everything. So getting into 2008 was a great year. Everybody was rushed into and I tried to, my problem in 2008 was trying to get the product out on time. But then it came to 2009, the oil, the entire well, just the entire world. You guys remember the 2009 scenario. Oil, oil in the gas field is also hurt very bad. Yes. We, later on, we had a really quick recovery. But in 2009, the drilling rig counts went as low as 300 or, or 370 something in the U.S. It was down from uh, 1,500 all the way sharply went down. So nobody wants the drilling equipment at all. And so the business kicked off in 2008, but in 2009, it's like start over again. Mm -hmm. Another really bad hurdle. So I switched my gears on the product direction. So I'm thinking about finding some more of recurring kind of business mm -hmm. and decided to go with oil production equipment like the drilling rigs on the surface and also sucker rods going down the ground so those ones if you're thinking about each oil producing well will need a set of those and even when they're not drilling some old oil wells will still need those kind of equipment because there's a there's a life cycle of it okay. so pretty lucky in 2009 to start the new deviated from the drilling rig business to the production equipment business. Mm -hmm. So that's a and that, transformation. Yeah, that that's like a transformation. It's the company name didn't change, the entire business scope has changed. And all oil field equipment over here in US and Canada needs the same type of equipment. Definitely. So you mentioned that, that that kind of changeover there at that time period. Would you say swapping over, you saw it as more of a breakthrough or just a change in pace? It's a breakthrough. And then I also learned there's a lot of, it's much more easier. The product itself is smaller in scope. 
and I went to the oil fields in West Texas, in Midland, and Odessa, spent quite significant time over there discussing with the smaller oil gas owners and uh, operation companies what their needs are and found a lot of improvement on design. So that's the real breakthroughs. I went back to China, changed the product design. Did you have any competition on that? You, you mentioned that initially you had only one com competitor, seems like. But now, did you have more competition? Yes, at that time, there's some, a lot of Chinese companies are trying to do direct sell, making the products. And Weatherford was the number two competition. They had about one third of the market share in US. And the largest one is called the uh, right now, it's, uh, later on, it was purchased by GE. So it's called Lufkin. And then they were an independent product company and service also. They were dominant in U.S. At the time, they are, they're over 50%. And then all the others are the small players. So I followed Weatherford footprint. So I found the product, the plants in China. Then I improved the design of the uh, pump jacks, the pumping unit, and we kind of uh, absorbed Weatherford's design and uh, Lufkin's design. So we came up with our own branding, and there were some patents issued in China as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a major breakthrough. I would say, and then later on, the kicks off, and in the United States, only we actually become the second largest at the time when I sold it. Mm -hmm. So I got about 37% of market share. Mm, wow. You mentioned uh, the breakthroughs you had. What kind of growth were you seeing? Like a double every year or triple every year, the revenue, the sales? Yeah, well, I can say the first trial order I got was about 40 pumping units for one of the clients. Mm -hmm. And after he took that 40, and he called me up, a very respectful uh, in the field, and he said, well, how many do you have, or how much can you make? I said, well, how many do you want? Mm -hmm. He said, well, probably I'll take 700 next wow. year. Wow. Yep. So from 40 to 700 in one year. Yes, wow. in one year, for okay. one client. Yeah, and the same client then went up to uh, 1500 a year. Wow. So it's it's amazing. It is amazing. So it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a kind of steady growth. He had some pretty early on explosion in those sales. Correct. Correct. The uh, 2010 and 12, 11 and 12 every year it's probably went more than triple. So because mm -hmm. I started 2009 was 40 was one customer, and then in 2013, we were making just for pump jacks, importing to U.S. was about 5,900 something. Wow. A little bit shy to 6,000 a year. Wow. Do, you, do you think the growth is because your product is more advanced or better than the, your competitors, or it's because the market demand grows? The market demand, uh, both. Market demand grows a lot for sure. And the products we make, I wouldn't say it's more, it's better than the uh, competitors, but it's in line with competitors, which is uh, truly more of a US design type. Mm -hmm. And also the cost. My cost was about 10 to 12% lower than my competitors. Okay. So. That's the key. If you got about the same quality, and then the quantity is, yeah, it's about the same. I wouldn't say I'm better than them, but we're definitely in line uh, with the cost of saving. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily to outpour, outperform the competition on like the build side of things. You just gave them a quality product at a price they couldn't beat and at the amount of product that they actually needed. Correct. 
I assume that you are making more money than them because your cost is lower. If you sell similar price at similar price, your margin will be much higher than them. Uh, well, at the very beginning it was, but soon when the scalability comes up and then there are some uh, product defect claims and everything, I would say the margin is about the same also. Okay. Did, did you have clients that didn't pay you? Yes, there's always clients default. It that's another lesson when the when the scalability goes up, you will find those clients. That's almost in every business. Like like I talked to all the people, everybody have the same issue. What kind of percentage will we see that defaults? It's mine is below two percent for sure. Okay, that's yeah. uh, that's acceptable. Very good example, I will say. Right. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So, obviously, you had some pretty early on success, and then things blew up in those 2010 to 2012 years. At what point, kind of along the road, did you start bringing in employees, needing additional support staff, people to help you run the business? I brought in employees back in 2007 after I got my first customer. So that first customer okay. spurred things on, and I know you told us by the end you were at about 24 employees. Was mm -hmm. that number pretty consistent throughout, or were you growing that employee base over time? Uh, it's growing steady, I would say. Every year it's more like a plan according to the business plan that I have. So it went from one or two each year goes up to 24. Okay. It's in line with the business growth. Are they mainly sales people or marketing people or technical? It's, it's a uh, technical first and then I had the uh, logistics supply chain people because that's a lot of works and sales. I have the sales people are not, not many in that 24 because I do a, uh, of freelance sales when they bring in customers I pay them commissions on that type I have quite a few of those mm -hmm. that's how the oil field works in US okay. a lot of them would would not be just dedicated to you or your company they would rather be paying a freelance work okay mm -hmm. for sure so just because we we haven't asked yet when you started up what type of risks were you looking at? Was it personal finance, going into debt, potentially losing everything, or did you feel pretty confident starting out? Starting out, I didn't know the risk. And I did not really think too much about the risk. I knew there was opportunity cost because I quit the job to do the business, but I feel passionate about it. I know that's I'm kind of feel boring about my normal job at the time, and so I just want to give myself a try. Anyhow, even today, but the real largest risk I think I've ever met was the product defect. Really, when when the suppliers in China when we're still across the ocean. I thought I know them very well. I call them every night, but still, when the orders ramping up, some of the suppliers cut corners mm. and later on become huge claim, mm. especially in oil fields. We're lucky we're in the, the production of it, so there's no of uh, human injury, but the failure itself costs a lot. It's not just about the product cost, it's also the loss of the well production time. And oil field people, they're really nice people, but when they get mad, they really got mad. They get sued. So. Were you losing sleep sometimes? Yes. At the time, we had uh, a, uh, a equipment really fall off and killed a cow mm. that was nearby and then I got this phone call 
I was really upset and, and lost my seat. Because that could happen for if there's people around, right? Yeah. Normally, how many hours were you working that time, a day? All the time. Just at least 12, maybe 18 hours. Just the only, only time I didn't work is when I fall asleep. But you had two children. You have two children. You have a husband. Was they I, complaining or they were supportive over the years? They, they give up on me. Because <laughs> so, I travel a lot. Especially I know my husband totally give up and saying, whatever, you do your own things. He knew he can't change me. But then, yeah, he complained at the first beginning. And then he didn't like the idea at all. So, but later on, he, you know, he understand and he's more supportive. He knows being me, I'm that kind. So it can't change me too much. Definitely. And kind of on a note that you mentioned, would you say that there were any, obviously you had some manufacturing issues where some companies were cutting some corners on you. Would you say that along the lines doing that manufacturing overseas was it worth it or did it cause more problems than not it's worth it it caused problems but it definitely was because it's uh those are just steel products the cost of saving was very significant even today when we're talking about the manufacturing back into U.S. I saw so many of those uh, startup ideas and they came to me and the cost of saving are still there. Just fortunately or, or unfortunately, I have to be frank looking at it, it's at least 25% of the savings compared with the labor cost and everything together. Hmm. So significant. Hmm. it's very significant. And was that overseas coordination difficult? Did you find there were problems actually getting what you wanted from these companies or were they pretty consistent for you? It's it's difficult and it's very inconsistent. Depends on the suppliers that you find. So I think that's one of the, you know, you're asking me the mistakes or risks. That is a risk. Mm -hmm. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way blind trust of the suppliers or just trust on their paper, that is one of the top mistakes mm -hmm. that I would think I should try to avoid. And that comes with a lot of risks too. So part of the things I, uh, I developed the team in China as on-site field inspectors. So the engineers, and they're all very hard, dedicated and hard workers really is very passionate about the job. So I sent them over to my supplier site. So they were there 24 by 7 for me, looking after the product quality and the progress of the project. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So obviously we've, we've talked a little bit about some of the mistakes along the way. What do you feel was some of the things that really kind of made you successful along the way? Obviously, you had that explosion in growth post-2008 and whatnot after you revamped. Other than that kind of change in focus, what were some of your keys to success? Yeah, like really understand the customer's needs. Because I saw this as opportunity. I saw the cost difference, I think. The, uh, my customer can just accept it, but actually I was wrong. They are very stubborn, you can say that word, on what they used to. So the first couple of years I tried to show them the product that they never really familiar with. It's the same thing, but it's designed differently. I thought I can make a difference, and I thought my product design were more modern or more up-to-date, but the big lessons learned is customer is God, and especially everybody has a way of using those tools or equipment. I got to have to change my mind and my way of thinking to adopt what they want. 
although it's less advanced and uh, maybe less efficient. Exactly. It's more traditional, it's less efficient, but that's the way they used to. That's the way they used it for 40 years and for the next 30 years that you can see. So that's really customers got is what is there. So that's a mindset change. So that's another key factor. I can run ahead of my competition, especially those made in China products. And then for made in US, also I'm pretty proud, well proud or not proud, I cannot say this. I made a change of the business because at the end of 2013, even Lufkin decided to move their plant to China. So the entire of those pump jacks, the uh, oil field producing equipment, the game was Weatherford and I helped push. And at the end of the day, all the three top brands, which we occupied about 95% of market share in US, were made in China. So, and they are they're still are made in China. So that's mm-hmm. more or less we could say you you spearheaded that transition of manufacturing for all these products. Yes, I followed Weatherford and Spearhead. Correct. Definitely. So, working along all this time, what would you say was the biggest sacrifice you had to make? Obviously, you mentioned that there was some pretty long hours you were working, never really turning off unless you actually fell asleep on the job. Other than that timing, um, what would you say you had to give up to make this truly successful? Family, that's one thing. So I really didn't have much time with my family, not even with vacations, because all the vacations I go with them, I'm still constantly over on the phone. There's a time, time zone difference, right? So families definitely, I, I think I'm very fortunate they, they understand me and they support it in their own ways. Definitely. That's, yeah. So now that we've established what it really took to get it up and running and what it kind of looked like on a day-to-day basis, if you wouldn't mind, can we talk a little bit about the transition of selling, what that meant for you, what it looked like? Sure. It's uh, it's my, uh, well, because the business took off and we are the top three in the nation, according to all the marketing study. So apparently we become a target of some larger players in the space. And then back in 2012, that's when, end of 2012, beginning of 2013, that's when they first started to uh, initiate a call to me of saying they're interested in my business. It took me a while to to accept the fact that I'm going to sell it. So it's probably about six months, yeah, four to six months, because I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm pretty passionate. Cash flow is great and business is very healthy and everybody back then was saying oil price is going to be in the 140 range forever right maybe even higher so i wasn't in the in the mood of even thinking about selling the business i had plans i have expansion plans actually i was thinking about getting my own uh workshop centers set up in probably like in Mexico or in US and all that kind of globalization kind of plans and getting more business into Latin America. So all of a sudden this is a change and what bothers me at the very beginning is the uh, the business who's going to acquire me was saying well we're not interested in any of your business plans. We're already a globalized company around the world you don't have to do all that. Just uh, all your uh, Latin America plan and all these workshop plans, just seize it. A very frank, I'm saying that we are only interested in your North America footprint and your supply chain in China. That's it. And that's the only thing we're buying. So don't worry about those. And 
it was very brutal. So I told them then, I, I don't want to sell my business to you. And of course, you know, after, after a couple of meetings together, all that started to making sense. In the meantime, they also purchased, acquired, acquired a few of my customers, which are the wholesalers for the business. So, and then they are all willing to sell. And these people are in the oil and gas field businesses for more than 40 years, or even some of them are almost approaching to, to 50, 60 years. And so they told me, well, you know, kid, you know the business? It's up and down. So you better, when it's up, you think about the downturn. So why not? And that was a click. I realized, you know, that was acquisition. true, actually. Yeah, it's very true, right? <laughs> and acquisition is a good idea. So I started to welcome the idea and think about it. Okay. So why Schlumberger? Because they're the biggest and the largest. And earlier, when I was in college, it was a name that everybody respected. So that plays a big role to it. At the time, oil price was at two thousand one hundred fifty dollars a barrel, right? Oil was at one hundred fifty dollars, and I remember Schlumberger had a market cap of one hundred fifty billion dollars. So that's a huge company, and we don't want to guess how much they paid you, but if a company with a market cap of one hundred fifty billion dollars is buying you. The number must be very significant. It, it's good. It was. It wasn't to the level I expected. Again, <laughs> because at the time I'm pretty um, enthusiastic about my business, and I have all the plans, globalized the plans, right? And they killed all that. So they discounted all those, and they just only focused on the North America. So. Of course, now look back, I think they did great. Um, I'm very fortunate. At the time of selling, I was very hesitated because I dis I disagree. There was a very, very, about a couple months of a dispute about the, the value of the company and how much they should be paying me, yeah. So you you would say that you had, to, you had to fight them a decent amount to truly negotiate what you thought would be a good deal. They didn't just flat out <laughs> offer you what you wanted right off the bat. You're right. You're right. It was about four months battle. Did you get some merger or concession broker involved or you, you just negotiated yourself? <laughs> I negotiated myself. <laughs> <laughs> the only the only reason is uh, Schlumberger wanted to keep it uh, just uh, under the belt because uh, my piece is a very key piece of the acquisition that they were doing on a bigger plan and they've been dealing with all these uh, brokers and merger acquisition teams. So when they found, I've been very honest with them when they at first asked me, do I have any broker? I said, no, I'm going to hire some. And they said, no, 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 do not hire anyone. Let's keep it this way. So, yeah, I, I do have, I, I have advisors. Okay. But they never, Schlumberger side, never wanted to talk to my advisors, the uh, financial advisors or acquisition brokers. Looking back on it, now that it's a few years down the road, obviously, would you have tried to make anything happen differently, or are you pretty content with the way things turned out? You mean to sell the company? Just uh, overall, or... would you have held on longer, pushed them for more, or do you think you got out at the right time? I got out at the perfect time. It's I saw... Which year was it? 2014, the summer. Okay. Yeah, summer of 2014, in August, actually. Okay. So, only about two months after I sold it, and that was the significant downturn. You sure knew when to sell? <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, at this point in time, um, 
are you involved still with the company at all, or have you fully relinquished hold of everything? Um, uh, I finished my service contract with them just about a month ago, according to the contract. It was five years, right? It was so I'm still a an advisor for the business and for Slumberjay on the space for another year, and. So, and as you can see, right after the acquisition, I'm the VP of the supply chain, so they, they really valued my expertise, and I helped them streamline a lot of the supply chain side of the business and the workshops, and had some large corporate or corporate level strategic just contracts signed up. However, the business had been struggling mm -hmm. for the five years. I would say even my side of the business, we were not able to be profitable. Because of oil price downturn, right? Because of oil price downturn. Yeah. And for sure. So on the future looking things or looking towards the future would you like to stay involved or would you like to transition out of the industry as a whole i'm still staying involved and also i'm transitioning out as well that's a good question so when will you start another business possibly possibly mm -hmm. or maybe just uh, invest into being an angel investor into many more businesses also, I was wondering, at this stage of life, money is not an issue anymore. So what makes you happy? A uh, good question. <laughs> I'm a happy person. Now I got to spend more time with my daughter. That's a good thing. I'm very happy. But I still need to be uh, excited about doing new things. Right. So uh, I think I still need more challenge to keep me happy. Definitely. I, yeah. Learn new stuff, like start running and do some other things. Just keep challenging myself. For sure. Um, obviously, you got out at seemingly the right time and have had some pretty good success with that. For somebody looking to potentially travel down a similar path to yourself, what would be your biggest points of advice for starting their own business and potentially selling that business down the road? Uh, advice? It's hard to say. I remembered, I like the uh, Walt Disney's quotes inspiring quote of saying I always just basically he said the way to get I think was that's what he said the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing mm -hmm. so that's a very good one. yes I this one inspired me a lot I always think about it so that's the advice if you do have a dream in this field, get started. Don't be afraid of the risk or the failure. There's got to be failure, there's got to be risk, but you have to give it a try. Mm -hmm. For sure. And on that note, do you have a favorite person you like to look to for inspiration or anywhere out there in the world that inspires you to keep pushing for that success on a daily basis? Uh, that's my mom, actually. She, she's always pushing. My dad is really a nice guy, never say much, but then my mom, ever since I was young, me and my brother, she's truly a tiger mom. And she's a doctor. And uh, I learned a lot from her, like the execution. She's very passionate. She always has some plans in mind, and she executes. So... The more, well, the older I get, 
and after I started the business, sell the business, get all these dealings with the difficult world, I think my mother has has a lot of impact and influence on me. So she is truly she's just a a, a doctor, but in her early years, she lived in Tibet as a military doctor for about thirteen years, and survived a lot of difficulties we can. You can't even imagine. So she's a happy retired doctor, and always challenge herself. Absolutely, very inspiring. Very. It's a wonderful okay. story. Wonderful, successful story. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For sure.